On this episode of Law Weekly, two senior lawyers share with us their assessment of how well the judiciary fared this year. We also have the highlights from the swearing-in ceremony of some newly appointed judges, plus a recap of the top legal stories in the news. Compliments of the season, everyone, and welcome to Law Weekly. I am Shola Shieli. A judicial worker strike action, a siege on the home of a Supreme Court judge, conflicting court orders, and even deaths in the judiciary, some as a result of the coronavirus. These are just a few of the things that come to mind when one thinks about the activities that shaped the judiciary this year. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, shares with Law Weekly his views on some of these issues and the impact it's all had. I'd like to start with your assessment of how well the judiciary fared in this year, 2021. As the year winds down, how well would you say that the judiciary has performed? I think uh, the year 2021 has been a year of challenge for the judiciary in Nigeria. Uh, in spite of the very hostile legal environment, our judges can be said to have contributed to the stability of the system, political stability in it. Um, I mean, you are, I mean, you will recall that this year we had the prolonged strike by the judiciary staff, a strike that was meant to advance the campaign, the struggle for financial autonomy for the judiciary. That battle was won in principle. We are now trying to see how judicial autonomy would be uh, allowed after the after the strike, we are having the first sets of budgets. So we want to see whether indeed financial autonomy would be institutionalized for the judiciary of our country. Secondly, the COVID-19 challenge was also confronted by the judiciary. Initially, I mean, I'm talking of the 2020-2021 legal year. This has been the greatest challenge that has ever confronted the judiciary, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world. Unfortunately, in our own case, we didn't take advantage of the pandemic to incorporate in our system virtual proceedings, I mean virtual hearings. We arrived the Supreme Court had made it clear to all and sundry that virtual hearing is not against any of the provisions of the Constitution with respect to fair hearing. Unfortunately, our courts are likely back to where we were before the pandemic, whereas other courts in other parts of the world, including, of course, the Africa Court on Human and People's Rights in Arusha, Tanzania, the Court of Justice of the Economic Community of West African States, the ECO has caught in Abuja, have all migrated to virtual again. As a matter of fact, the ECO has caught has said that it is not going back to physical again. I can say that since last year, July, the Equals Court has not conducted any physical I take part in the proceedings of it. And the last appearance in the African Court 
the 11 judges, judges of the court two parts in the proceedings from different parts of the lawyers representing about 12 countries sat in their country and participated in the proceedings of the court. And that is what we expect in it. Apart from Borno State and Lagos State, where some judges will conduct virtual here, subject to the agreement by cancer, uh, we still have a long way to go. What would you say is the greatest challenge militating against our uh, proceeding with virtual, virtual court hearings? Number one, uh, the system will have to provide funding to ensure that virtual hearing can be conducted. Our courts will also have to try as much as possible to meet the expectations of the public. I'm just reading the president this morning, where he was saying uh, his usual comparison between when he was a military head of state and, you know, and now as a civilian president, and where he still said that uh, when he was uh, a military head of state, it was much easier or better to fight corruption with profound respect. This regime has recorded more success in the fight against corruption than when President Buhari was a military head of state. Unfortunately, certain elements in the government have, in fact, frustrated from the courts, I mean, frustrated the courts from contributing meaningfully and positively to the fight against corruption. You have had cases where the Attorney General has filed no leprosy to stop serious corruption cases. You have had situations where the Office of the Attorney General has entered into agreements with people who are facing serious corruption charges. And those agreements are then taken to court. We have never had this kind of situation in our country before, where you go and sit down in a hotel, either in London or New York, and sign an agreement with those who are wanted to stand trial in your country. And then you present the court with a fatal company. Is there anything that the so country can do about again, that? Beg your pardon? Is there anything that the country can do about that where certain people in government, like you've said, no, it's frustrate the president this. who is complaining that he's not getting the expected results to look inwards, go back to the drawing table, whereas our courts, I can tell you, that, not less than 1,000 houses have been forfeited to the government in the last six years or thereabouts through the instrumentality of the law. The last one, I think a few days ago, the ICPC, ICPC recovered from one single civil servant, not a politician, 301 houses and about 9.6 hectares of land in the federal capital territory. Now, this Assets have been forfeited to the government. I think there was another one about 38 properties were recovered from a lady, I think she added one of the agents. Another one has lost about 80 properties, no, 86. Another lady. Now, I mean, the one of 301, you know, it's a man. But the courts are giving orders. Interim orders, permanent orders for the fifth forfeiture of this asset. But the trial of those who are involved is being frustrated by the government itself. So the president cannot complain. Another
senior lawyer Tunde Kolawale wonders about the role of the National Judicial Council, NJC, in a federal system. He speaks about reforms and other issues. By and large, I would want to say, uh, given the challenges that we have earlier on mentioned, the COVID-19, the prolonged uh, strike, the uh, executive rascality, as I would say it in terms of um, some of the agencies of government or the executive of government, that the security people uh, going into people's home to do what they are not expected to do. Uh, in spite of all that, you still want to say that the Nigerian judiciary has done uh, fairly well. And they've done fairly well simply because of the caliber, the competencies of uh, some of the people, or most of the people you have in there. Even though it couldn't be said to be 100 percent in terms of personnel uh, layout, but by and large you could say 95 percent of most of the people you either find on the bench or in the bar have been able to live to expectations as regards uh, what the society expects of them. The drawback has always been that um, most of the things, or some of the things we would have loved to do as an institution, uh, there's always financial uh, uh, incapacity to get done with some of those uh, things. Uh, from the executive arm of government, it's only when money is available that they will release to the judiciary. Uh, even at the level of the bar too, you and I will know that when individuals are not doing well, the bar itself will not be able to uh, will not be able to execute most of the program that they have uh, set for themselves because most time um, the dues, levies, and charges that we pay are not enough to run our activities. I would say that uh, from the level of finance. The executive arm of government has still not uh, lived up to expectation. The chief justice of the, the federation, the CJ in the respective states, they have to go cap, cap in hand. And it is only when it pleases the executive that these monies uh, are released. The second one is the politicians. The politicians, I uh, want to say, they've been uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, born in the neck of the Nigerian judiciary um, because you find out with the money in the hands of politicians and all that, there is hardly an institution that they cannot compromise. And most times when they want anything done, they are ready to do whatever it takes to really get results. You have seen the number of cases in which even judges are now being disciplined with regards to the uh, kind of interim models that um, they have been given. We are now aware about the chairmanship of the PDP, in which a contractual trial and then well. even even courts that had no jurisdiction to entertain some of these matters and all that. They went in there because of the influence of uh, the politician. And why do the politician have that kind of overriding influence or very big influence? Usually, what well, they appoint most of the people on the on, on the bench. Secondly, like I said, they have enormous resources at their disposal. That they can always deploy um, to get whatever resources uh, that uh, they wanted. But talking but when, about the, yeah. the discipline mm. that we saw mm. come from the National Judicial Council, especially for some of those judges mm. whose decisions were questionable, exactly. the granting mm. of expertise mm. orders, mm. and you've talked about political interference, and mm. a lot more people think that as we go into the election season, yeah. we're going to see a lot more Exactly, of that. more challenging. Do you think that mm. that disciplinary action of the of the NJC, saying barring some three judges from promotion, do you think that it's far-reaching enough? Because I've heard some senior lawyers say nothing is going to happen. It's just the same of the same. <sighs> Are those judges even interested in being promoted? No, Are some I... of them even going to be qualified for promotion? Mm. You know, there's been so many issues no, A raised. lot has happened. A lot has happened. Those things have been documented. They are part of, it's part of their records, or I mean, part of the records of those judges. Letters will be written to them informing them that uh, for social reason and all that for this period of time, they are not entitled to promotion, and then you can get these privileges and what have you. For people at that level, I would want to think that that is um, a more than enough sanction for those of them who could uh, read in between the lines. Because in future, their children, their grand great grandchildren might be leading the, 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 
the history of the Nigerian law and come across that their, their, their father, their grandfather, their, their grandmothers and all that were indicted one dummy at one period or the other for being uh, for not being diligent in the discharge of their responsibilities and what have you. Where I have problem, um, honestly speaking, with due respect is that I don't believe in the NGC. Uh, I once wrote a paper with regards to that, that in the federal system of government, uh, and then the NGC for me it's uh, an abnormality. In the past we do have uh, the Judicial Service Commission at the federal level and also at the state level, uh, which were in charge of uh, discipline, promotions and the uh, remuneration of judges. And why don't we leave it as that? Uh, well, it was thought that immediately you have the NGC. Things will get better, but has it get gotten better? The answer is uh, no. Welcome back. Following the approval by the NJC for the appointment of new judicial officers, some state governors have started to swear in the judges with a charge on them to be above board and to ensure quick dispensation of justice. River State Governor Yeson Wike has sworn in four new judges into the High Court of the state with a charge on the new judicial officers to be courageous in discharging their duties. Governor Wiki also challenged the judiciary in Nigeria to adequately protect the rights of judges, warning that if the intimidation of judges, as recorded in recent times, is not checked, no judge will be brave to handle political cases, especially as the country approaches an election year. One of the judges inaugurated by Governor Wiki is Chinelo Chidubem Odili, daughter of Supreme Court Justice Mary Odili, whose husband was governor of River State between 1999 and 2007. Others are Poplin Sylvester Sunday and Akatima Gabriel Kyo, who were both private legal practitioners, and Chinwe Amanda Nsirim, the daughter of a first-class traditional ruler in the state, who was nominated from the River State Magistracy as Miss Odili. The swearing-in of Chinelo Odili comes one month after her sister, Injideke Wosu Iheme, was sworn in by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Tanko Mohammed, as a judge of the appeal court, alongside 21 others. This is a very difficult period we're in now. And unfortunately, unfortunately, the judiciary has not helped in protecting their own. If what is going on now is not being stopped by the NJC, I can assure you, no political matter will go before any judge, and that judge will have any courage to handle such matter. From next year, it will be very turbulent. And so matters will come before judges, allow them to dispense the way they think it is. And that is why there's always an appeal. But the moment that any judge gives a decision, we politicians, we must always write petition. That you cannot take it uh, away. No politician loses any case and thinks that there's nothing that went wrong. Every political case will be read with political connotations. So you must have to protect your judges. Uh, politicians are used to writing, even when we know it is not correct. We can say, let us write and try our luck. Anything can uh, happen. And that anything that can happen is because we believe there are those in authority that will listen to us. And that is not the way it's supposed to be. In Ogun State, Governor Dakwe Abiodun has admonished the new judges in the state to be above board and show quick dispensation of justice, just as he called for more synergy and symbiotic relationship amongst the three arms of government to deepen democratic values. He made the call in Abeokuta, the state capital, during the swearing-in ceremony of five newly appointed judges of the state customary court and the high court. The event attracted the presence of members of the state executive council, the state chief judge, other judges, members of the bar and bench, and families of the five new judges of the customary court of appeal and the state high court. One after the other, the judges who have been found worthy in character took the oath of allegiance and the judicial oath, then signed the dotted lines. Governor Abiodun addressing the gathering admonished the new judges to be transparent and accountable. I have no doubt that given their backgrounds 
and proud record of Adia State, they will be most worthy additions to an already illustrious higher bench. As I congratulate our new law lords, it's a belief that your experience and skills will first manifest in the successful and continued implementation of administrations building our future together agenda. In the last 30 months of this administration, the three arms of government have continued to work in unison without jeopardizing the principle of separation of powers and without compromising, in particular, the integrity of the judiciary. The governor, while assuring of the necessary reform, cooperation and understanding, also used the opportunity to announce some welfare packages for members of the state's judiciary. I approved a 100% increase in the rental allowances for the judges to the 200% of their basic salary. And in the spirit of the season, this is Christmas, the spirit where we exchange gifts. I would also like to share with our judges that we'll soon be presenting a memo to the State Executive Council, which seeks to provide for an allowance, I will not name it here, an extra allowance for all our judges that will be targeted at enhancing their welfare. Let's just keep it at that. I'm sure that um, this we should do before the end of the year, and you begin to see this reflect at the turn of the new year. By the way, I'll be expecting my own Christmas gift as well. One of the judges who spoke on behalf of other judges promised not to betray the confidence reposed in them. And we want to assure all that we are going to abide by these oaths. So help us God. We are aware that the all not done to us has attached to it a great obligation. And we pledge here that we will fulfill that obligation. These new judges who have been found worthy in character and trusted are expected to give impetus to the administration and quick dispensation of justice in the state and strengthen the confidence of the people in the judiciary as the last hope of the masses. And just before we go, a recap of some of the top stories from the courts. We begin with the report that the Independent Investigative Panel on Human Rights Violations against officers of the defunct Special Anti-Robbery Squad, SARS, and other units of the Nigerian police has awarded the sum of 146 million naira to 20 victims and families of those who suffered different violations of their rights by officers of the defunct SARS. The panel, led by its chairman, retired Justice Suleiman Galadima, presented checks to the victims as compensations and to temporarily assuage the loss they suffered. At the courts, the Federal High Court in Abuja has nullified Senator Andy Uba's participation in the governorship election held in Anambra State on November the 6th this year. In his judgment, Justice Nyang Ekwe held that Andy Uba was never a candidate in the election, having emerged from an illegally conducted primary by the All Progressives Congress APC. Justice Ekwe also held that the plaintiff, George Mogalu, succeeded in proving that the APC did not conduct a valid primary election and was entitled to a refund I was entitled to a refund of the sum of 22.5 million naira which he had paid for his nomination form. Still in Abuja, the Supreme Court has set aside the conviction and 30-day sentencing of a senior lawyer, Joseph Mwobike. In April 2018, Justice Raleigh Adebi of the Lagos High Court had convicted the senior advocate of Nigeria, Joseph Mwobike, after holding that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission proved beyond reasonable doubt that he was in constant communication with some court officials to influence the assignment of his cases to preferred judges. But the Supreme Court faulted the decision of the Lagos High Court and the Court of Appeal Lagos, which had upheld the conviction. The court added that the EFCC lacks the power to investigate and prosecute the offence of perversion of the courts of justice. In Lagos, a chief magistrate court in Yaba has granted bail to five students of Dewan College following a charge of conspiracy and homicide made against them by the police. The police charged the five minors following the alleged murder of their schoolmate, Sylvester Oromoni, aged 12. But Chief Magistrate Alatabo Swadiola, who heard the bail application, granted them bail in the sum of one million naira each. And we round off with the report that the Lagos High Court has adjourned till January the 24th the trial of Abubakar Peters and his company Nadabo Energy Limited for an alleged 1.4 billion naira subsidy fraud. 
This was after the chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, Mr. Abdurashid Bawa, concluded his examination in chief before Justice Christopher Balogun. He will, however, continue his testimony on the cross-examination. That's the show this week and indeed the show for the year. Thank you for watching. Please catch up with past episodes on our YouTube page. I am Shola Shoyeli. See you in the new year.